Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. No, hey, hey, you leave me alone. I'm allowed to shoot here. I got to pass. Who do you think you are? I am. I am. It's baseball season. And I'm going to take whatever picture I want. So, Stephen, we're, we're like a week away. Actually, it is a week away from today that the Phillies have their home opener. Oh. To, and, that, and that means baseball season. That means I go and take lots of baseball photos. Hopefully, I'm still waiting on the pass. I think everybody's waiting on their pass right now. And even if it doesn't come, I'll probably get a temporary pass to go shoot at least that first game or the first series. Do they do anything special for the first game in terms of, you know, a, a good photo op? Uh, I mean, I, I think they announce, they probably announce all the players. They probably Any do fireworks or anything like that. No, it's a day game. It's a three thirty. Oh, okay. I think it's a three thirty game next Thursday. So gotcha. I'll be, I'll be leaving work at like after lunch to go hang out at the stadium early and, and prep. I mean, I got to think about like, what is my goal this year? when going to baseball games yeah i mean last year the fact that you could take any lens any new camera any anything really that's new and test it out in a professional environment as a working professional at a major mlb game yeah so i mean last year my i get bored like i get bored i don't think i stayed for an entire game until play until the playoffs it's rare that i'm gonna stay for an entire game i mean like i said it really just became an opportunity to test out a new piece of gear it wasn't really like you were covering the game it was like hey let me take a couple photos during an inning or two and then you know call it a day it also was a good opportunity for me to get out and go do something instead of drive myself nuts for here sure. at the studio or at home trying to figure out what do i want to do whereas i could go there and get some just be around people there's so many times especially during the winter time when there's new lenses that come out or a new new piece of gear and you're like i have nothing to photograph there's no sports going on now this gives you that chance every other day to go and shoot a, uh, a game I mean, I could just go shoot some rocks if I really, really, really wanted to. I could I could take pictures of rocks and, and then call it a review in Canada. I could do that. Who are you talking that about? Would, that would totally work out. So anyway, my focus I've, I've thought about for this year for the games is obviously using the 4x5. I'm still prepping. I've been shooting with it. I'm waiting on nine four by fives to be developed right now i did that math of baseball thing the other day where i'm trying to figure out what speed film i need to bring because what will my shutter speed and aperture be if i uh want to get a certain angle and a certain shot now i put this up on instagram and, and quickly i'll go over it is there there's an angle that we call inside third base it's right next to the dug out for the away team but it's it has a perfect view of home plate if you remember seeing the impossible shot that is the angle that you get to shoot ah, and yes. so i know that the the four by five camera that i have has a 178 millimeter lens which is about a 50 millimeter equivalent so i found a photo that was shot exactly at 50 millimeters at f 2.5 which is what the lens shoots at that i took last year with the R3. So I, I have a representation of the exact settings that I might need. Now, I was shooting at one two thousandth of a second at F2.5 at 1600 ISO at 50 millimeters. And so I have to figure out the math for what shutter speed do I want to use? I know what aperture I want. Actually, I know the aperture. I know the shutter speed. And the only thing I need to worry about is the ISO because the max shutter speed on the camera is one five hundredth of a second. I want to shoot around f 2.5, which means the only thing I need to figure out is the ISO based off of those settings that I shot that picture at last year. So it's easy to figure out. Well, yeah, you just split everything in half. Y you you plan on shooting at two five still, even with large format? I mean, that that's going to be razor, razor thin depth of field, right? It depends. It depends on what I'm doing. So I talked to a bunch of different photographers and people are saying that I'm overcomplicating and I'm overthinking and, I, and I'm not. I'm not overcomplicating. I'm preparing for different scenarios of what I want to do. I feel like you do this on every shoot, though. You really think about it. I'm not saying you're overthinking it, but like you really take the time before you go there to have everything ready and, and good to go. 
Well, everybody keeps pointing out the specific photographer who shot in the 40s with a 4x5, and I have his books, and I go through them. The difference is the lens that he was using or the lenses that they had available for these cameras back then were like f5.6, or they're shooting at f6.3, so everything they're shooting most likely is going to be more in focus. I'm not going for just taking pictures with a 4x5. Like, What's the point of just taking a picture with a 4x5 that's just going to be a larger format? of a basic baseball photo. Oh, I'm with you. Right? And so I, what what I was talking about, my buddy Dan, uh, talking to him about, because he's the one who's been processing the negatives until I process them here, is I might need to shoot some test shots at 2.5, then raise the aperture to like 3.2 to 4 and to 5.6 just to see what the effect will give me when I when I when I get the photo in the baseball stadium, because I would think that uh, an equivalent depth of field on a large format camera would be, you know, like five, six on that would be equivalent to like a two eight or something on a regular 35 millimeter full frame. Well, I'm not trying to do the exact same thing. I'm trying. The, the reason you have this lens is you're trying to get this look that you just can't get anywhere else. Sure. You, you want that trade off one look, basically. It's kind of, but it's kind of a trade off because it's like, how sharp is it at F2.5? And the photo of me sitting on the bench looks amazing the way that the, at the art museum, the way that everything dissipates in the background and it kind of looks cool because you can still see what it is. But on the flip side, when we took F7.1 in front of the art museum, it is so tack sharp and the bokeh of the background is fine, but it looks more like a regular picture and figuring out the film. So if I'm shooting from that inside third base, I know what the lighting is at 1600 ISO. I need to the, 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 the film that I can get is 400 speed film. Right. And I'm thinking about night games under the lights. And that's why I'm doing doing the math. The 1600 goes to 800 goes to 400. That's two stops of light. I was at one two thousandth of a second at F 2.5. I know I now like my max shutter speeds one five hundredth of a second. So I change that to one five hundredth. The F stops F 2.5. The ISO is 400. Two stops above was 1600. It's the exact same settings. I changed the ISO to 400. That's two stops. I was at 1 2000. That becomes 1 1000, then 1 500th. Rocket science. What? No, it, it's just you do the math. It's just simple math. It is. I changed one thing and that affects the other. And then I. I played the game. I, I got my I got my lighting perfect. And so it should be around 1 500th of a second at 2.5 at 400 ISO. And then I have to figure out. Uh, if if I do go to a higher aperture, it's going to cut down on certain amount of light coming in, which means I need to drop the shutter speed somehow, right? Uh, it's like it's like there's the play because you're not going to go. There's no 800 speed film four by five. Honestly, too, I don't mind if you had to drop your shutter speed and have some blur in a photo like that. I mean, it, it's a it depends. large format film photo. I don't expect everything to be tack sharp in terms of motion blur or something like that. It depends on what I'm going for, right? And then sure. I was thinking, I'm if not I want to get about a, shoot at like a super slow shutter speed showing the movement, you know, the pitcher being a ghost at that point. I wonder if I can use pre-shot on my 4x5. Uh, you have 120 frames per second, right? Yeah. No, because then I was thinking like, oh shit, I get all my settings right. But now I, what if I'm trying to get a guy batting? What the fuck? How do I not just press it and he didn't swing? You know? Uh, yeah. And then you're like, shit. Did you know that when they shot the Hindenburg, the guy who photographed it for the the press, he had like a bulk loaded four by five and it has like six shots in it. So what happens is you move the dark slide, take the picture, pop it in, pop it out. And it like moves one to the back and one and moves another one up. It's like you can shoot in rapid succession with a bulk loaded four by five. It was a totally different thing that allowed you to speed shoot. Frame rate would be today. Would that be like three frames a second, you know, speed wise? <laughs> Jared's doing the math in his head. The math is mathing. Uh, it's approximately 2.5 frames per second. If I had to guess, it's probably, um, that's probably, probably like one and a half frames a second because you have to pull, press, put it back in, pull again. It's got to it's gotta be close to that. Yeah, not It's got to be one to two seconds per shot. But at a time where you didn't have to flip and rotate the, the holder, then, then, then that's it's that's continuous what you shooting, have. basically, where you didn't have that prior. Yeah, 
the ability to bang out multiple shots. But I also have now an 8x10 view camera sitting here that I didn't show you yesterday. Oh. 300 millimeter lens f5.6. I think that's the equivalent of like a 90 millimeter. I'm not going to be shooting that anytime soon. 300 equivalent to a 90. Wow. (laughs) Yeah, it's a 300 millimeter f5.6. And it's like a 90 millimeter and 5.6 is probably like an f2. I really don't know the math of that. Yeah, even wider than that. It, it might be. I just don't under, I don't know the maths for that and I haven't looked into it yet. And I don't know that because it's an actual eight by 10 where you can rotate and tilt and pan and do all of the corrections that you could do to get all the different things. Anyway, baseball season's coming up. More baseball photos, more testing. Uh, I mean, shit, w- w- like if an R1's coming, if new lenses, we're going to talk about a Sony rumor. If that lens is coming, then I'm going to take that out to the baseball field because real world situations call for real world photos. Yeah, I just came up with that. I just found a calculator for an 8x10 to a 35 millimeter full frame equivalent lens wise. You said a 305.6, right? Yeah. It says a 305.6 would be equivalent to about a 40 millimeter 0.73. Really? That's what it says. Okay. 40 millimeters? Uh, yeah i don't know all right all right i mean that's very interesting i'll have to play with it and see i haven't even taken it if it was a four by five it would be equivalent to about an 81 millimeter 1.5 uh 300 millimeter really i thought they were long because my 178 is a 50 so this is saying a 178 would be yeah 48 millimeters okay all right so then it then it's probably pretty close yeah well, I, I don't think I'm getting into 8x10 anytime soon. I got to work with the 4x5. A 40 millimeter 0.73? I mean, your your depth of field has to be nothing. <laughs> Obviously, depending on your subject of camera distance, but wow. Oh, geez. It's so complicated. It is so complicated. Um, anyway, welcome to Raw Talk episode number 94. If you're listening on the YouTubes, feel free to leave comments that don't suck. Um, they tend to <laughs> suck on um, Instagram. T- that's the one thing that happens when you put stuff on YouTube or where comments are able to be posted. People love to shit on you. Love to hate. Especially before they even listen to something. Sounds familiar. Before they even listen to something, they like to go ahead and leave comments. But anyway, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole where did i put the phone number steven i can't find the phone number steven where did my phone number go well i can tell them the phone number because i memorized it 313-710-9729 i definitely do not have the text line up in front of me yeah i don't know where that is anyway that's uh if you listen on the audio podcast that's that's where this is designed for but if people just want to listen on the youtubes perfectly fine uh listening to the audio there, putting it on in the background and just listening and, and having a good day so uh we already talked about the baseball thing the four by five we got something about tickety talk and a photo app we got to talk about my next photo book uh that's been in process for a minute we've got some ai video discussions and uh, annie Leibowitz commenting on ai and seeing what she had to say and something interesting from nikon is that they put out a nikon wildlife guide for the z8 and z9 which i thought i would take a look at because i wanted to see what their recommendations were for shooting uh, where to set the autofocus settings. And so we'll go over some of the pages there to point out how they're suggesting people shoot it. I will say that it seems like it's a very basic beginner um, guide for people that are spending a lot of money for a Z8 and a Z9. Uh, so I, I just think it's a little basic. But I mean, it's we'll, a guide. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a guide, and I probably don't agree with the settings in the guide. Um, and I'll read those when we get there. But let's let's talk about the next photo book for a minute. Um, I did my first photo book a couple years ago during the pandemic. That was the Bernie book. Uh, the the book that I was debating to do as well at the time had to do with my early photography, but geared towards the concert work. Yes, and so. It took a lot of time to try and figure out what was I going to cover? Am I going to put my mom's photo story in a photo book along with early music stuff? Is it going to be like my early stuff from 2000 and after? And and it didn't matter if it was music, sports or other. And then I came down to like, let's figure out how to do the concert or music, my music journey as a photographer. Yeah, I think that's your bread and butter. I think that's how you really became a well-known photographer is is jumping into that music world and taking photos for, what, 20 years of musicians? I became a well-known photographer by making YouTube videos, Stephen. Because I'm just I saying, remember... <laughs> you really were more of a concert photographer, quote-unquote. 
I was I, I was shooting a lot of concerts back in 2000 to 2010, but I was struggling to get known. And I, I recall this. I recall sitting in my brother's room um, where I had my computer set up. No, I might, no, I was in my room at the time still. And just sitting there looking at my website like I have a great website. Why are people not finding me? I am the best. What's going well, on? <laughs> look, I thought I, I know was that was going on that. in your head. <laughs> no, I'm like, my fucking shit's really good. It's better than this person. Well, the best this though is, is looking back at some of that really, at least for me, looking back at some of my early, early stuff, you know, first few concerts. And it's like, oh my God, I probably thought these were good. These are well, trash. You sucked. I mean, you sucked. So it's, okay, I, okay. I, was, I, t- I was taking the best I photos forgot. since you, day your one. Your first concert was perfection. My first concert Every was amazing. shot used. <laughs> Perfect. I only took like 10 rolls of 800 speed film and got like two usable images. <laughs> That's going to be in the book. Like the book starts off with, um, I think with the first picture I want in the book is the Adam Duritz photo that I took at the Counting Crows show, which was the first show that I ever was at. Worst live band ever. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to know why they're the worst live band. Because they don't tell play the why. songs like they were played on the album. That is correct. Uh, I will suggest like, that let's nobody do an goes, avant-garde version of one of the famous songs like Mr. Jones and completely mess it up. Mr. Jones. <laughs> it sounds like a weird cover band and or me, something. Mr. Jones and me. It's just like it's the worst. Do not go to see the Counting Crows ever if you want to hear the music the way that it was written and the way that they performed it on their albums. This is there's shit that you do. It's a, it's like Smashing Pumpkins. When I was out on tour with Perry, which yep. this stuff's in the book, um, we encountered a couple of shows. We played a couple of shows for or along with um, uh, the Smashing Pumpkins, which at the time it had Chamberlain on drums and it had Billy Corgan singing. It didn't have anybody else it from the original band. It was basically a Billy Corgan band, yeah. I really wish Zwan music was on Spotify. It's still not on Spotify. That Zwan album is so good. Weird. Oh, so good. Um, but Billy Corgan would play Smashing Pumpkin songs not like they were written, and it really sucked. And I think a bunch of tours that they do more recently, he plays the songs the way they're supposed to be played. I think he does, yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to go to a show where the, I, I don't care, dance for me, monkey, right? That's what it is. <laughs> I'm literally paying to see you perform the songs that I love. <laughs> well, that's that's that What's Her Name song, dance for me, dance for me, dance for me, oh, 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 oh. Oh, yeah, that song. I got nothing. Dance monkey, uh, Tone Loke. No, Tones and I. <laughs> Her name is Tones and I, <laughs> not Tone Loke. So Tones and I, really amazing story. I watched a documentary, a short documentary, but how she got discovered because she was just busking in Australia. She was like homeless and she got a keyboard not knowing how to play guitar or play guitar, play the piano. And she was able to start. She would just do songs in Australia, right on the street as a busker. And then she realized like all these people just want her to dance, right? And just perform and entertain for them and she came up with this song dance monkey the moral of the story is go listen to the tones and i song and find on youtube where you hear the 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 the, it's kind of inspiring how she was discovered and how she went from nothing and just busking and becoming a success success with those things anyway i don't know where i was going and how i went off task there I went off task there, but so the book weird. is, I, I, I've seen a bunch of different layouts and I haven't been happy with a lot of the, the layouts that I've seen. And so I got to the point where I had all my four by sixes printed out from Printique and I started to lay out the sections on the floor. They're still laid out over there on the oh, floor here still at the on studio. The floor. Uh, what was that months ago when you did that? <laughs> yes, yeah, Stephen, because I'm leaving it there in case I get inspired or have other ideas. I don't want to break it down. We have all of this infinite space. I might as what well use like a, it like a 20 by 15 foot section that you have spread out (laughs) it's it's like a whole room it's like the size of most people's houses (laughs) but i i i wanted to lay it out on the ground and i filmed it i was going into the basement yesterday and i was like tiptoeing trying to go around all the photos and not step on them but that was my brain on the ground that's how i was able to lay it out and so i sent my designer the 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 a video of it so she could get a better idea of order. And the whole idea here this time is trying to not have the gutter be so bad. And so we're, we, we've seen a bunch of different designs or a d- bunch of different ways you can do the binding. Like there's a thing called a Swiss binding, which basically allows that protector on the spine to move and get out of the way so that you can then flip it and it can be completely flat. That means though that you start to see the binding strings every 16 pages or something 
Well, I don't know the photos that you you have picked just yet, but you know the Bernie photos. A lot of them were very you know centered. A lot of the subject matter was in the center of the photo. Is it the same greatest with the, photo ever? <laughs> it, the greatest composition it, ever. It, the best of the best. Is it the same with the concert photos? Or is there a lot of you know centered subjects? They're all over the place. It's different because sometimes you have group shots and sometimes you have rule of thirds stuff. It's it's very similar. I'm just saying. Well, but, the gutter at the end of the day, if it was the same as the Bernie book, will really be a big deal to me it we'll was really a big getting deal away I, yeah i think it would still be because we lost so much in the gutter but that's because again up, the photos a lot of them were centered no the reason i got upset was that the original sample that i saw showed us it laying flat and i was really happy and that's what i approved oh yeah and when we got the final books they're like oh well these were machine bound which means they're tighter and i was way, like well, way tighter like well if you're going to send me a sample to approve, it should be the same exact thing that I will be getting. This is just fucking annoying, really annoying. So the book is being laid out. Uh, I, I, I have to go through and, and I think it's better now what she did, but I need to see it a little differently on a PDF. So I need her to resend that. And I also need to just go through and like, there was like a photo that was from later in my career that somehow she put in a certain position early. And I'm like, no, that doesn't belong there. So we really haven't, you know, talked about this specific photo book or what you plan on doing with it with it, but what happens when you do the final approval and it actually starts to, you know, go into production and be made? What's your ETA for that? Is that a few months away? Is that next month? Is that next I don't year? Know. We realized that I I hired her uh in May of last year. No, March so it's already of last been year. 10 months. It's been give or 10 take. months, but there's been yeah, it, it just it's not I part of it is it was very it's more difficult to outline something that's not fully chronological order sure whereas the other book was chronological order i wanted it in the order that the photos were taken and so this just it has different sections there's the first tour with perry farrell like it starts off with my early work some film work some early digital in the early 2000s and then it has to go to somewhere else and i don't like what positioning she has certain things in right there's the modest yahoo tour stuff there's the perry farrell tour stuff and then there's also just randomy stuff and silver tide stuff so there i think it's gonna it's much closer i personally just want to know you know if you have behind the scenes images of uh maroon five in the dressing room i want to know what conversations were being had i want to know what was going on i want to know why you were back there i want to know what tour it was all of that i want to know the behind the scenes of those behind the scenes images well, and that's exactly what I'm going to be explaining cool. in the podcast portion. I'll have some written portion in the book. The Maroon 5 thing is super interesting, how I ended up backstage with them. And I'll, I'll just tell you guys now, they were opening for John Mayer. They were still in a van, so they weren't even anything just yet. They were new. Songs about Jane, the album, never took off early, right? Then this was prime Napster era, 2000. Yes. Prime Napster era. I remember doing a shoot. Uh, the manager called me for um, Maroon 5 and said, hey, they're going to be playing in Princeton University at one of these. They got hired to play in one of the castles there. Like It's a whole thing that the college students, gigs. Yeah. students get paid to be a part of this thing. It's like they're, they're study castles and they can eat there and they have security to help make sure they get home when they're drunk. It's fucking, <laughs> it's highfalutin <laughs> oh, Princeton shit. Wow. Let me do some studying while I have Maroon 5 in person well, in the so background. I remember, so one of the rooms had Maroon 5 playing and I remember walking in there and on a chalkboard it was like Maroon 5 playing tonight. Download their music on Napster. Tomorrow, like, Metallica. <laughs> Yeah, but no, I mean, it on the chalkboard, I remember it saying, download their stuff. So this was the beginning of it. People were not going to buy the album oh, yeah. when they could go download it at the time. But so I, I just walked backstage myself. I just walked backstage. I don't know what I was doing. I just, security didn't stop me. And I went and I walked back and there they were folding their laundry that they had done, just sitting there backstage, shot on film. And I've come to realize that it's all about pretending that you're supposed to be there when you're backstage. I've said it a million times. As when you're long walking as you're, up, you're confident, they don't question you. Well, and, and so, and, and most of the security people there, they're just hired guns that aren't really security. They're young people. Like they're not stopping shit. Yeah, if something they happens. Don't care. <laughs> so like when you're walking up to a gate, going to backstage, I make the first contact. Hey man, what's going on? How you doing? And I keep walking. They stop. They want to say something like I did this the other day when I went out to temple university to shoot some uh, women's lacrosse, not like they're really 
securing women's lacrosse very well. It's a little different there. (laughs) But I walk in and they have, you know, to get on the field, you have to go through a little barricade. There was these two kids sitting at a makeshift desk and I walk, I'm like, hey guys, what's going on? Going to go take some photos. They're like, okay. You know, and then I just walk onto the field. So you just act as if, but also don't be a dick. Sure. Um, Anyway. So, yeah, there's a lot of behind the scenes photos like that, whether it was with Jet or Nora Jones or the Counting Crows or Perry Farrell and Modest Yahoo and Silvertide. And man, there's Beck photos and uh, Mariah Carey. All over the place. Confessional. It's like it's it's all over to grunge to everything in between. I didn't put the Marilyn Manson photos in there. That's one thing I did spitting at you or whatever he was doing. Yeah, I didn't have him spit it. But some of those photos were so tough. That show was so dark to shoot at the electric factory back in the day. Electric factory in general just sucked. They always had those weird red, orange, wash fills. The worst. It it was tough. I shot Beck there, though. That was much brighter. Hmm. Well, when they bring their own lights, it was always fine. Yeah. But usually bands weren't big enough when they played the E-Factory to do that. No. So this book is in the works. Another large format book it's going to be another seven pounds <laughs> do you plan on doing a kickstarter of some sort or how do you plan on releasing this I, to the I public? probably will do the kickstarter even though you give kickstarter a lot of percentage points for sure. it it's just the it's the easiest way to do all of the 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 uh offers and stuff right like the just so you're not w- sitting on hundreds of books at the end of the day you know you know how many pre-orders there are and all that yeah, but you, I, I last time with the other one, I already had the books ordered before the Kickstarter because yeah. it, it, there's like months and months that it takes, and I don't feel that it's right to make people wait eight months, nine months for a product that they bought on Kickstarter. Oh, I've I just I've waited years in the past for products that I've uh, funded via Kickstarter. Yeah, so I, I think it, it's the the only way that you could do it otherwise is if you do it, you set up a store on your website and you have the early bird specials and you have all of that stuff. You do your but own. I just think. Yeah. I just think you do it on the Kickstarter part because they collect it. People don't get charged until uh, until the thing ends, right? So it's like it's more just back end stuff. It, it, it's easier for for me as the creator. But what I need to do, prices are up. I'm going to need to make sure that that the the cost of the book makes sense, mm. so that I, that I mean, the goal is to obviously break even for me. Sure, really, it's break even, and then I have extra books, and you try to make money extra after that. Um, and this should be hopefully an easier sell than a, a Bernie book, which would turn off most of the half the people out there. Politics, so I get it. Yeah, you you just hope that this this you're able to sell pre sell a lot more. I still would probably do the 1,250 books. Um, the cost on that look with the Swiss bindings more expensive. It's like thirty one dollars and change per book, and that's not accounting for like twenty grand that I got to pay for the designer. And it's the designer that is also doing the coordinating with this the the lab and pro and and and, and just managing the whole product uh, yeah. process, which is not which is worth it, right? Like I've always said, you could find someone to do it for for half the price. But it's not going to work out and you're going to then have to hire someone else to, to pick up the trash. But they're going to do half the job. Yeah. Right. And so that that part, like I love the printer that we used, which means I might go back to Italy to do it. So the, the whole thing with it, with the book is having the specials where you get a print and you get something else special that I can mark up the value like it's a $150 product or a $200 option, giving people multiple options so that I can hopefully generate and break even much sooner. I mean, one of the things I, I do plan on doing is a golden ticket that one of the, uh, well, actually the, the golden ticket thing is interesting. One of the books will come with a Willy Wonka golden ticket, which will include coming to Philly for a concert that I plan on doing for like a book release party at my house. You're going to have Maroon 5? No, 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 I'm not going to have Maroon 5. I, I could have, I'm going to have musicians playing, but I want to do a party like that. And that's one of the golden tickets is getting the trip here to Philly to come to that party. And I don't know if I will offer, maybe I will offer an option where someone can buy a ticket for a super high value. Like there's only going to be like $30,000, five, five of those or something. You want to be and, with and, me at my own house? Hey, 50 yeah, but, grand. But hey, I mean, that's what you do on Kickstarter. <laughs> like people, when they put out like movies, do you want to be in the movie? It's 50 grand. Yeah. Right? yeah just no, to have I, like a speaking line. So it's just something but that, yeah. <laughs> but it's something that if someone sees value in that and they want to do that, then, then it will be an option. And that's a way that you, what would the number be for you? 
I don't have a number yet. I haven't decided. Ballpark. Five grand. Okay. At least. Yeah. Twenty five hundred. It maybe twenty five hundred. What would you know, that include for them? Not flight, I assume, right? Just the just the the privilege to be at the yeah. No, House the only one that photo. the only one that would get flown in would be the golden ticket winner. Sure, yeah, that makes sense, right? And so there's the golden ticket winner to 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 come to the event, and so that that would be like for two people. Is right? it black you, tie optional? There's no black tie at my house. <laughs> Is it I shoot raw shirt optional? Yes, I shoot raw shirt optional. extra tight, extra, extra small, extra medium. Ah, uh, yes, okay. So that's that's the idea. Those are the ideas I'm kicking around. And so that way, if you can if you can get a couple of people to spend more money because they see value in it, that makes it much easier to break even uh, and start to turn a profit on the book. Look, my goal is not to make a shit ton of money off of making a book, but the book acts as a business card that is better than any other business card you could send to anybody because no one's throwing that book out. <laughs> Let me leave this 20 them. pound business card on your desk. Seven pounds, <laughs> seven pounds. So anyway, that's the little update on the book that's going on. Uh, I'll keep you guys updated when I figure out cool. a layout and and just figure out if we can get the binding right. Uh, I, I I'm sure I, you will. I might threaten them actually. I you just might threaten I them am. right off the bat. No, I'd just be like, look, if you don't get this, if it's not up to the standard, because they did send a sample of the Swiss binding and I open it up and I'm seeing other issues that showed up. I'm like, how could you guys let this book out? Like a sample the needs to be literally a sample of the final product. Like if I get a, a, a sample paint card, the final paint should be the exact same color. You know what I mean? There's a difference, though. They can't just print one book off of the, the press because there's press set up. There's making all the all the uh, the screens and everything. So I get that part being different. It's the binding I care about. I know their printing is going to be gorgeous because it already is. I get it. They should just emphasize that, hey, this is not a production run model. This is a hand bound book. It may be different in the final production run, blah, blah, blah. Or give me a sample of a, pr a full production book that's similar. From another in run. Binding. Yeah. Exactly. And that's and so when they sent me one, I'm like, this is this sucks. Because I opened it and I'm like, wait, if pages get printed, you know, on, uh, across from each other, then why is there a white gap now in the middle of the print? physically a white gap where there was no printing oh. i'm like but this defeats the whole purpose of not having a gutter yeah like if you printed it to be gutter so that it like that way they so i i so if I you see, lay it flat enough there's literally a white gap in the middle is what you're saying uh yeah no yes so i don't know if it's because i don't know if like page two like if you have a two-page spread are they printed on one page or is like are do they end up on a different page so that when they come together they have to be on the same page I right assume same page they just leave a gap in between to account for i that don't know gutter. how it, i don't know how it works i don't know how lay i have to ask my person how that all works because yeah i can see how it might not line up and if it doesn't line up then i can't do it like it's just you know and and and, and it's just like so many people i don't know if anybody's ever solved this issue maybe <laughs> or because people just live with the gutter there's so many books i have where i'm like this sucks because of the gutter anyway let's let's move on let's let's move on like saw those rumors that tiktok might be releasing a photo app oh and quickly want to go over that with you um i've deleted tiktok from my computer from my iphone for now i actually went on it last night and just yeah. keep in mind i know nothing about tiktok i never use it I just I can't stand the UI and the layout of that app. I, again, I'm not familiar with it at all, really. But just kind of going through there real quickly, I'm like, man, this is just I'm just mindlessly scrolling, uh, and I just find it difficult to like search for things too. But I know that's not really the point of TikTok. They don't want you to search. It's more let's feed the algorithm to you. Mm -hmm. I just found that it wasn't a pleasant experience overall, and I much prefer something like Instagram, but that might just me being old and not being used to uh, using TikTok, because again, someone like my wife, she's obsessed with TikTok. Oh, uh, yeah. So that's, I, I deleted it because I don't want to get sucked into it. The the China thing about it right now, you know, elevating certain things. I talked about it on Photo News Fix this week, um, and that's my hesitation. But with if they come out with a photo app, I'll 100% download the photo app, try to build a following there if it's possible. But the thing you're going to have to be careful of is what do the terms of service say? Will China be will, will TikTok be able to take your images and do shit with it? Not that I really worry about it. 
of course, the security issues are definitely there. But uh, my other concern is, will it just become a rehashed version of TikTok where well, people are thing. just going to be re-uploading their TikToks to that app? Or is it meant to be just a still centric app, which I doubt that's going to be the case, but we'll see. Wouldn't I just feel that like be interesting? Be a, a still centric like Instagram yeah, used would, to be? Yeah. Wouldn't that be interesting if it's like the if you want video, you go to TikTok. If you want to have photo discussions, you go to TikTok photo and but I think they you have w- it there. They really need to limit it to photos only. They can't even we'll allow for happens. video because it's just going to be again in the beginning. Everyone just posting their TikToks over there, trying to gain more of a following and get people back to TikTok. Yeah. Well, I we'll, we'll see because it's like threads. Why on threads do you post videos and, and you can post videos and photos in threads as well? Like I get when it's meant to fo- be more Twitter and just text only. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Technically. But anyway, I, I just thought we would bring that up real quick because that, it's an interesting thing to think about. I have no problem with TikTok trying to do that. No. Now, is it bad timing because they're being uh, threatened right now that they have six months to, to divest and sell TikTok to an American company in order to not be banned and blocked? So in terms of the ban, we talked about that in detail last week. I talked about it on Photo News Fix this week as well. Um I, I still don't think it's going to happen. I think I think they will sell. They're worth way too much money for them to risk being banned in the United States because there's a lot of investment money, VC money that is thrown there from American investors. And so there's no way they're going to allow it to just not be here where there's 170 million people and billions of dollars to be made. Oh, yeah. But I'll try a photo app if they have it. But I just think it for might sure. be tough timing if they decide to put it out now. I also think it's just going to be tough to still compete with Instagram. I mean, there's been other people like, uh, is Vero still around? Vero, whatever. Vero. I mean, I mean, they did a lot of things right, but I just think they didn't catch on. I think it's going to be very tough to catch on. Yeah, it's tough to get get lightning in a bottle. Exactly. It it, it really is. Yeah. So we'll see what happens with TikTok. If they do have a photo app, it's going to be interesting to see if it comes out and how it works works um have you been seeing some of this open ai stuff the videos from the uh the software they have called sora i have where and it's it's scary it's, and mind-blowing and just wow <laughs> yeah so for those who don't know you've seen the chat gpt you've seen uh uh, generative AI where you can type a word type stuff in and it will add photos you know fill in the spaces well Sora is that for video you can give it a text prompt like a certain type of dog painting a picture of its favorite toy uh, painting a painting of its favorite toy and it creates a moving video of that or you could say an elephant made of leaves strolling through the forest or you could have two women sitting and interviewing each other. It's pretty insane what this thing is capable of doing. And so there's many schools of thought. There's people that are totally anti this. And then there's people who are like all in on it. What, what do you think of it, Stephen, after seeing it? I think it's a very scary thing in general, uh, mainly for people that work in the high end production, special effects area, CGI, stuff like that, because I think it's going to overtake Hollywood where they can simply just make something up via text prompt uh, instead of spending millions of dollars on CGI work. And it will look incredibly real. Now, I don't know how how that works in terms of licensing and putting that into a movie and stuff like that, but I'm sure there will be some sort of subscription-based platform eventually that they will create for Hollywood, for cinema in general. But what what do you think overall? I mean, so so yeah, is it is it scary? Yeah, the the negative aspects of it are absolutely possible, right? The political ramifications of putting a exactly president or a candidate in a compromising position and people believing it. And I think it's more scary for a public figure like that, where they could scan the entire Internet and see all of the the clips and, and Hollywood movies of a celebrity or whatever it may be, and really get a perfect visual to recreate their face and put them in a different situation where that obviously really didn't happen, where I guess the average person, it's a lot harder to be like, hey, take myself and put me somewhere because there's probably not enough information to be like, hey, put Steven Eckert in this spot. But you start talking about celebrity and public figures, that's when it becomes really, really scary. And I mean, I already see it with like video games. 
there's video game clips out there. The video game clips are so real. I have people like my grandparents sharing it and be like, oh my God, I can't believe this happened. Like a fake tornado in a video game somewhere. And they think it's real. Now I can spot that it's clearly just a video game, but imagine what happens when open, uh, whatever it's called, Sora starts creating these more realistic lifelike videos and they're going to think it's real. There's a lot of people out there that are very gullible. The videos that they've made so far, they're not all perfect, but they are very good. Close. Look, I, I, yeah. I'm not I'm not anti the progress of this type of creativity and and whatnot. It, it will. It's going to. Yes. Will it take away some people's jobs? Uh, it always does. Um, but the people that learn the technologies and get behind it and adapt are the ones that come out in the forefront and are able to make a living out of it or able to adapt and just grow with it. Uh, I look, I, it's going to it's going to happen whether you like it or not at this point. So just being a hater isn't going to work like you can fight, try to fight this stuff. You could you can attempt to do it. It's not going to stop it. So you got to learn it and see how you can use it to your advantage. The issue that people are having right now is they're not forthcoming with where they got all of the data that they train the AI model on. Right. They said that they they got some of the stuff where they had licenses, but they can make like if you make a deal with Google. Right. And you can you can uh, scrape all of Google for all the information. I mean, that's YouTube, too. Right. Right. If you can scrape YouTube for all of that stuff, I'm not getting paid for that. If they use photos, if they used whatever, I'm not getting paid for that. And so the there was a bad interview with someone from OpenAI where she the, the woman couldn't answer the questions about did they use X, Y and Z to uh, train the model? And she's like, I'm not sure about that. To quote them, she said, if they were publicly available, publicly available to use, there might be that data, but I'm not sure. I'm not confident about it. I'm just going to go into the details of the data that was used, but it was publicly available or licensed data. Yeah. So it doesn't matter. Incredibly vague answer. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, basically, yes, they're using whatever they want to to do it. I mean, look, you could feed in the entire history of, of movies in a fell swoop into this and it can create the backgrounds motion plates everything so you can literally be like look i want it to be make me a casablanca scene and you throw in deep fake technology on top of that and you have people voicing over someone like tom cruise i mean you can really put him in a bad place and make him do anything you know yeah but i'm not worried about the deep fake stuff as much i mean yeah it's there but it's more about how is this going to evolve into cinema Uh, and tv i mean like i don't i still don't think you're gonna be like you're gonna have it write a script for you and then put that script into sora and have sora make an entire movie from it i mean that would be pretty interesting if you had an animated movie in the style of pixar uh like finding nemo sure and you wrote a script that said make me something like this but there's someone who still needs to polish the stuff. There's someone who needs to still come up with most of the general ideas to then input into these models and see what happens. That that leads us to something that Annie Leibovitz said, and she was talking about not worrying about AI or that she's not worried about it at all. Of course, she's not. Her career is pretty much done at this point. <laughs> yeah. Annie Leibovitz. Yeah. So Annie Leibovitz basically says that she's not worried about artificial intelligence um, and that photography itself isn't real. Well, what I would say to that Ah. is the photography that she's creating generally is made up out of nowhere. Correct. Um, But what but but you can't just read a headline and then and then be like, this person is so wrong. Um, So she says that that let's see Leibowitz gave her thoughts on AI and I'm reading an article from Petapixel here citing my source Leibowitz gave her thoughts on AI while being inducted uh, as a foreign as- associate member of the French Academy of Fine Arts in a ceremony at the Institute of France on Wednesday and quote that doesn't worry me at all she tells the AFP with each technological progress the uh, there are hesitations and concerns you just have to take the plunge and learn how to use it that's one thing learn how to use it is very important Uh, In her comments, Leibovitz suggested that AI-generated images have just as much merit as photographs. Quote, photography itself is not really real. I like to use Photoshop. I use the tools available. Well, it all depends, right? That's the Kate Middleton thing. It all depends on how you're using it and how you're manipulating something. And uh, Pete Souza came out and talked about how they should have called the Kate Middleton photo fake, just an outright fake because of what she used. And then cites that, you know, 
some of the things that are okay to do are exposure, make it brighter, you know, contrast like that, which is then you're still manipulating. I was going to say that you're just contradicting yourself at that point. But Stephen, is anything we're doing digitally really real? Because it's basically if you really want to go down light, that road. I, bet, yeah, taking, I don't know. We're taking the light, we're converting it into zeros and ones, and then putting it out beep, as a beep, beep, you know, beep, 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 converting it into a picture. Anyway, I don't know. Uh, I just think when it comes to photojournalism, like someone again, like Pete Souza or something like that, where you are literally not allowed to manipulate a photo in any way, minus your basic edits, like like, like you said, exposure, contrast, whatever it may be. I think that is truly a real photograph versus, you know, someone something like Annie Leibovitz, where she's taking something and highly stylizing it and editing it via Photoshop. Yeah. But she also then goes and she adds that even framing a shot implies editing and controls on some level, which is true. Even uh, yeah. in photojournalism, yeah. you have the ability to crop out without cropping just by the way that you compose the image. You can manipulate the context for sure. You can tell the story how you want it to be told. Yep, that's exactly what you do. So, you know, I think a lot of her images are uh, made up anyway. They're highly stylized, highly edited. They are what they are. Which but is fine. you know that. Yeah. It's right. And it's fine. So I'm not, I'm not worried about AI photography taking away from me being able to create images at all. Because how is... AI going to go to that baseball game and capture that moment. It's not. Now, is that AI going to help me in the future to better capture certain things? I think the technology, of course, will do that. And I'll be there to learn it and try to use it to my uh, full extent to get the best shot that I can. Agreed. That's my goal. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I love using the AI aspect of Lightroom now with the auto masking and all of that, where it automatically finds the subject or the background or the sky, lets me mask that out instantly, unlike back in the day where you had to manually do all of that, and it took hours. Yeah. You use it to your advantage, and uh, you just don't go over the top. Now, moving on, I found it interesting that Nikon put out a Z9, Z8 professional setting guide, Wildlife Edition, which... I wanted to read because my goal was to find out what are their recommendations for how to use the Z9 and Z8, you know, properly, because people tell me I don't know how to set up the camera properly. Um, but I wanted to see what their suggestions were for how to set their autofocus. And it's interesting, a lot of the things. I find this to be a very basic manual, um, like basic camera settings. They talk about AF area mode, 3D tracking, ISO sensitivity. This is page uh, 18, uh, page 16. They have this is obviously specific to wildlife yes, shooting, specific to wildlife shooting. Okay. And it the, the ISO sensitivity, they're telling you ISO auto is where they want you to shoot picture stand uh, style standard white balance auto raw or jpeg or or shooting that stuff which is fine but they go on to explain the the different af area modes 3d tracking select 3d tracking for af area mode to automatically track focus on fast moving animals but then there's uh some caution 3d tracking the camera may be unable to track subjects that are similar in color brightness or patterns to the background change visibility in size color or brightness are too large or too small too bright or too dark move quickly or are obstructed by other objects or leave a frame man it sounds like 3d tracking isn't capable of doing very much that explains why it misses so much but I'm just saying, Stephen, I have I'm no just comment. Saying, I'm just saying that's why it misses so much. I, I, it's not the only I didn't come here to bash on what they did. It's good that they're putting out this this thing. But the more you read it, the more you're like, I just don't agree with this stuff. Like page 22, page 22 tips for wildlife photography. The following settings are recommended depending on the scene you are shooting. If a stationary subject suddenly starts to move, we recommend uh, assigning AF area mode 3D tracking to a function button. I mean, basically, they want you to have multiple AF area modes, AF modes capable or accessible at one time, which is like way too much thinking to even worry about. Um, so to capture a subject moving at high speeds, we recommend selecting auto for ISO sensitivity, minimum shutter speed in the photo shooting menu. When auto is selected, the camera will choose the minimum shutter speed, blah, 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 blah. They're basically telling you to shoot on full auto. Um, and they're telling you aperture priority is really where they want you to shoot. And I find that to be really a bad recommendation 
Especially when you have a Z8 and a Z9. I mean, I, I would say most wildlife photographers probably do shoot in some sort of auto mode with compensation, if I had to guess. Right. Um, right. What do you think? Uh, they do, but they don't have to. Oh, I'm not saying they have to. I'm just I mean, saying I would think most do. And if this is one more of, of the, a beginner guide, it's not a bad recommend, recommendation. I know, but beginners with Z9s, you just... Well, you know, that's the irony is like, do you really need a beginner guide if you have a Z9? But we've talked about it before where you might have unlimited money and know nothing about photography and still buy a flagship camera. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of oddities in here, like setting your shooting mode to aperture priority and then going and talking about exposure compensation it's like if you know that you want to underexpose or overexpose you can just do that with your settings with your with your shutter speed and you know what your aperture is going to be and you can set your iso the light really well, isn't changing unless you're i mean if you're tracking a bird and it's a partly sunny day and the exposure is constantly changing yeah that is one of the only times that i would attempt to consider to use it but i will say that I shot in Kenya for 12 days in manual, in full manual, and got amazing images. I mean, this guide even talks about changing the tone of the of the image in the camera. It's like, why would I worry about that? Just shoot raw. Did you find yourself having mainly like blue skies, sunny days no. in Kenya? Or were there a lot of overcast days, partly cloudy days where the clouds were coming in and out? Exposure was constantly changing, stuff like that. We had we had we had overcast days we had the ones where it was the most beautiful sun in the world but there was the storm coming yeah. at you right where the light is going to change but it's not changing at such extremes that you can't just quickly change something or even if you're off say half a stop or even a stop it's not that big of a deal especially because you're shooting most likely at base iso at the end of the day so a lot of it could be corrected if you were a little off but I, I, it seems like this is geared more towards someone that wants something straight out of camera perfectly exposed yeah now you can go on to uh nikon rumors posted this and you can download this pdf and, and i get to page 26 where it says medium sized animals visiting a particular location and they show one of the worst lion photos that you would ever see published <laughs> it's literally a lion just sitting there the, the the it's so flat they didn't color corrected at all and their settings were equipment use z9 nikon 70 to 200 2.8 shooting conditions shutter speed 1 500th of a second aperture 2.8 exposure compensation plus 0.3 ev focal length 185 and their shooting mode so the following settings are recommended for photographing medium-sized animals that visit a particular location such as a resting area or a watering hole aperture priority continuous low speed of one to five frames a second i don't know why you would dumb down your camera to do that a aperture priority mode I, I assume this is meant for more animals like you said like resting or something like that because it's a slow shutter speed it's a slow frame rate there's no need to shoot at 120 frames per second or 30 frames per second so i kind of get that recommendation but i don't know personally i would still be shooting a little higher because you don't know what's going to happen that's the point right there steven you don't know what's gonna happen yeah if you're set to five frames a second and the lion out of nowhere decides to go like fuck a giraffe and you're like <laughs> wow look at this you want to get was that at one shot. two thousandth of a second for that one and multiple shots like you want to shoot at 20 frames like you have the ability to do it i don't know why you wouldn't do it at this point and and the excuse of i don't want to edit so much is not it because you just went all the way to kenya on safari to get all the photos once you in can a take lifetime the extra time. photos yeah you can take the extra time to uh to edit but the reason i wanted to read this is i wanted to see what mode they suggested for autofocus and their af area mode they're suggesting is dynamic area af small that is the old school mode that isn't lock on tracking, isn't 3D, isn't face detect or IAF. I mean, again, it's for a resting animal, but I'm surprised there is not a animal uh, IAF recommendation there. It, 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 it doesn't. In terms of subject detection, you know. Well, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And then when it came to birds, they had auto area AF, um, 3D tracking, continuous high speed, 20 frames a second for birds, aperture priority, auto ISO. So it's just, I don't like the basics that they're trying to tell you here. I don't think that makes any sense. Like, why would you shoot at one to five frames a second? And and the biggest moral of the story here. And what I, really what I wanted to find out is all the recommendations of the autofocus settings, because that is the biggest concern that I have. And I mentioned about the Z9 and then people comment and say, but Jared, you're setting the camera wrong. 
I will just tell you that I went to Kenya, which you already know, and I had an R, uh, what, R3 and A93. And I never once changed the autofocus settings off of the settings that I had that I always use because they just work. You don't have to change through seven different settings to find the right one to work in the situation that you're in because those settings just work. Whether it's a bird, whether it's a plane, whether it's a giraffe, whether it's a, a, a dinosaur, the, the tracking settings are the tracking settings are the tracking settings. So I don't recommend reading this thing fully and, and abiding by it. I think that it's a great starting point if you're a beginner shooter, and if you just so happen to have a Z9, fine. You spent all the money for that. Um, please learn your camera. But I think you know it's good enough as a starting point. But I don't fully agree with everything that they say in there. And the modes are in in the R3 and the A93. It's essentially like an all-encompassing AF, correct, with a proper subject detection mode like animal AF. And then you also have the joystick focus box enabled as well. If you need to manually override that or tell it where to start, like 3D tracking. Yeah, I have that. I have that option available Just to so me. people understand like how you have the camera set and that you never really have to change out of those modes for 99% of situations and scenarios. No, I have a box that's available that I can quickly move if I need to. Um, but the cameras just do such a great job at this point that they, they find, find the subject that you want. Yeah. I have the point active just in case I need to move it because I run into it. Or if issue. you're shooting a, a static subject, that's not an actual subject. You know, if you want to get some kind of particular landscape and have, a, you know, your favorite, a rock in focus in the foreground or something. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's one thing. That's one thing that you can do. Yeah. Um, but no, they, they just they, they work really well. So anyway, uh, if you do want to read over that, you could go ahead and read over it. I just don't fully recommend following the instructions to a T. And to wrap up this episode, uh, you may have noticed I put out the Fuji X100 6 real world review. It's finally up and at them for you to check out and uh, and, and, and to give a watch. Uh, but and it's a little different, too, because there is an incredible amount of photos included in that review. Uh, typically, we only show 10, 15, 20 photos. There's probably over 100 in that particular review because you did spend over a week, two weeks with that camera. Yep, doing a, a bunch of different shoots. I, I also shooting. uploaded I uploaded all the full res images to Flickr, by the way. Flickr. Yeah. What is that? It still exists, but <laughs> I uploaded all the full res there. It's funny. Like you read the comments. You're like, oh, I didn't know you would be capable of getting such great shots with a camera like this. Oh, wow. It's just like, well, yeah, one, I'm really good at what I do. Put any camera in my hand. I'm going to get great results. Yeah. I'm going to get great results with whatever camera is in my hands. Um, but you, you need to know what you're doing. And it's just funny reading the comments where people are like, Oh, these are some of your best photos ever. And it's like, no, they're they're not my best photos ever. I was just handed a camera that is in a like I'm locked in a box, and I got to figure out how to make it work. Yeah, and again, I do think it is a little bit of a different review for us. We did show a lot more photos than usual, and I think that stood out to people. So um, there was also the rumor that 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 Canon might be working on a retro camera. I mean, there's always a rumor that Fuji's working on a retro camera. They already have a camera that they could kind of turn into a retro camera in terms of like the guts. They have like the M6 Mark II, for example. It's not that old of a camera. It's a 32 megapixel sensor, APS-C sensor, 14 frames a second. It's got like 4K 30. It's got everything. Why not just put a new shell on that and, you know, call it a retro camera, make it look like an AE-1, make it look like... Um, QL17 or whatever, that 1970s that camera that looks more oh. reminiscent of the Fuji X106. But I, I, they don't know if it's necessary. That's the thing. It's like, do they need to have the expense? Are they going to sell enough? Does it get people into the brand? I, I do think, you know, with Nikon having the ZF, uh, I prefer full frame and an interchangeable camera. I think there's a lot more uh, you can do with a ZF than something like an X106. I just wish Canon had that option as well for, for people that want to just kind of walk around and have another second camera to do that with, whether it's fixed or interchangeable camera. Well, so uh, in terms of the sizing of the camera in the review, it's interesting. There's multiple ways that you could take a Fuji, any review, right? It's how you frame it as a reviewer uh, will determine how people perceive it of course right a lot of the nikon stuff people think is nikon bashing when you just point out the truth and they're going to comment and tell you that you suck without watching the video that's and not your understanding opinion. that's not the truth 
Right. So <laughs> with the Fuji thing is we chose not to really talk about the other options that exist from Sony, like an A7C2 that is more expensive and that's not going to fit in your pocket. It was more of a standalone review. Let's just talk about this camera and what this camera offers only, and that's it. It was not a direct comparison with which camera should you buy if you only had to buy one camera, whether it be the R8, the A7C, whatever it may be, that $1,600, $2,000 price range. What's the best option for you? That's a totally separate video that I'm sure we will do in the near future. Yeah, it, it wouldn't be my choice to spend $1,600 on this one camera if I'm a Canon shooter and I can get an R8 that's tiny. If this is the only camera you were buying, yes. Yeah, not not going to be the only camera. That now, I'm if buying. it was a secondary camera, I think it's a great option, the Fuji X106. I just think f there's better full frame options that aren't even that much more expensive. I mean, yeah, the A7C2 might be a little bit more expensive. Throw a lens on it, but you can change. Lens. It's going to be fantastic. R8's going to be fantastic. Keep in mind, uh, though, you do have to buy a lens. I mean, you're adding yes. on at least 500 bucks more to that price point where this is coming with a fixed lens, $1,600 all in. R8, you're looking at at least two grand. A7C2, probably three grand after you add a lens, even if it's basic. I think with the R8, you're probably, you could, I think that camera's pretty cheap now, right? Uh, and if it's on sale for $1,300, that's not bad. I don't know. Let me and see. And you can find it for $1,000 refurbished. So it's on sale right now for $1,300. Say you paired the 35 1.8 with it from Canon. That's another 500 $500. you are looking at $1,800. Okay, that's actually Steven, fairly close. Steven. Right now on Canon's refurb site, which everybody should check out for lenses when it's when when you're looking for lenses, it's a thousand and ninety nine dollars for an R8 refurbed, and that means you could probably get some nice lenses uh, <laughs> refurbed as well, which is pretty yeah, insane. I'm more talking about buying new, but I, I see your point. Um, well, yeah, R8 is a lot closer in price now that I now that I look at it after it's yeah, on sale and everything. But but the size is the the thing. The size is is different. We showed, for example, an A7C with a 35.14 uh, in comparison. And yeah, the Fuji, you could kind of stick in your pants pockets if you had really big pockets. But the Sony, you definitely cannot. So here, Stephen, a refurbished 50 RF50 1.8 is $99. Mm. At uh, uh, a 24 to 70, uh, 24 to 105. You're also missing some of the bells and whistles. There's no IBIS. There's no ND built in filter. Uh, there's a lot of other things that the Fuji will have over this. Sure. Fuji well, has a mechanical getting... shutter. The R8 does not. Yeah. I mean, this is the direction that I personally would go. If you're like a Canon shooter and you want something small to take on the road, just get an R8, in my opinion, and use one of your lenses and take it on the road with you. I think you'll just be much better off with that. See, my Here. thing is like if I have an R6 II or an R5, it's almost the same size. You know, it's yeah, not that's like you're not really sizing it. down. No, that's not that's not worth it in that yeah. case. But but you know, uh, I just we we just we we put out that video. I think the reception was was more positive because of well, I've noticed if it's a positive review, it tends to lead to positive comments because people aren't trying to defend their brand. Every people are like, oh, I love how you do these reviews. You give it to us straight. And I still gave it to this. I still point out the things that weren't the best in that camera, but it wasn't harping on it and really taking it for what it was. And I think that's the, the part. That's I bet different. if we started comparing it like we just did to the RA to the A7C2 to other cameras around that price point, then we would have got a lot more. Uh, a lot more negative comments, a lot more pushback. Yeah. You can't do it. It's not that. It's not meant to be it's that. Not it's not even comparable. What are you doing? Yeah. Anyway, that's taken us to the end of another episode, number uh, Raw Talk 94. Thank you guys very much for listening. You can get your uh, Raw Talk fix every, every Friday, uh, wherever you want to get your podcast, including YouTube, as always. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Jared Poland, Photo.com. See ya.